All technical communication is about claims and justification. Even if you're not arguing something persuasively, you'll still need to make sure that you understand that you've made a claim and that that claim has been justified. There are two main types of claims that you're likely going to encounter in your technical communication course. The first is a fact. Facts are fairly easy to justify, and realistically you just need to find a source with trustworthy evidence. If this isn't a fact that you yourself have personally come up with, then just finding a good source from a reputable place is fine. For example, if I said to you that Mechatronics Engineering is a program offered at the University of Waterloo, then a good way to justify that would be to just go to the website of the University of Waterloo, find where they have information about Mechatronics Engineering offered there, and put that into my document as a citation. The next type of claims, though, are going to require you to justify things in a much more detailed and careful way. They are called assertions of truth. This is where you say something and you assert it as though it is already true. These are much harder to justify and require you to build an argument. As an example, if I said that Mechatronics Engineering at University of Waterloo develops career-ready engineers, there's a lot to that claim, but I've said it as though it's a fact. I'd likely have to talk to alumni, I'd have to talk to businesses, probably find some internal reports from University of Waterloo, and essentially build an argument showing that the engineers who graduate from the University of Waterloo's Mechatronics Engineering program are capable engineers in their careers. That's very different from just going to a website and finding the one place where it says, hey, we offer this program. This brings us to justification. If you make a claim, you have to justify it. Now, a very common mistake that beginners make is to assume that something is common knowledge when in fact that isn't a valid assumption. You must be absolutely certain that something is common knowledge. This is quite challenging because normally what's common knowledge in one field is different from that in another field. So for example, if you're writing something and you require the user to understand a lot about calculus, can you assume that calculus is common knowledge? If you feel that there's an assumption that needs to be made, either because the technical communication will be far too long if you don't, or because you're going to go off on a tangent that will confuse readers, you typically simply have to tell your audience. Here's an example. If I'm assuming that the reader requires, say, calculus, I might say at the very beginning of my document, it is expected that the reader has a background in calculus or linear algebra. Perhaps I might say that I, it is expected that the reader has gone through an undergraduate engineering course or is a first year engineer. All of that tells the reader where they have to be in order to understand this document. It's something of an art to determine when exactly it's allowed to just assume this away and when you should be providing that background. This normally comes from experience and also asking questions. Whenever you're not sure, it's best to ask your reader or a representative of your set of readers what they know, what they don't know, and what they need to understand. But now let's say that you've made a claim and you understand it is not common knowledge. You now have to provide evidence. Evidence comes in many forms. You can find a newspaper article, a journal article, a textbook. You might even run your own experiments. The key thing is that evidence needs to be trustworthy. The very strongest type of report, the one that you can trust the most, is those of direct measurements and observations. But you still have to be very careful. So a direct measurement or a direct observation is when you yourself personally go and set up an experiment to measure one particular thing. And it doesn't have to be a science experiment. For example, if you say that most of our users like the color red, then you might want to set up a focus group asking your users which color do you prefer. That direct measurements, 80% of them said red, are very important. However, if you set that up incorrectly, then you're basically making it so that your support is not valid. For instance, if in that focus group you say, do you prefer red or black, when in fact most of your users prefer blue, then you've given them a false choice and you've essentially made your data useless. That's why very frequently when you're doing an experimental study like that, even one that actually requires you to take measurements of, say, a circuit. You always provide an experimental procedure that is as detailed as possible before you provide your evidence. That way, the reader can understand that what you've written and what you've done match a high standard of excellence. 
The next option is indirect measurements and observations. Sometimes you simply can't measure something that you want. For instance, you might say, our users trust us. Well, how do you know that your users trust your software company? You can't just ask them, because most of them might say yes or might say no, but that doesn't give you a lot of information because the users may not even understand what that means. Do I trust you to not blow up my computer? Do I trust you to do what you're promising me? Do I trust you that you'll come to my home and fix my problem? I don't know what that means. So rather than getting into a very long survey or a very, very long experiment, you might try to do something indirectly. For instance, how many of your users are repeat customers? If you're doing an experiment with a physical system and you want to measure something that might be impossible, for example, how much heat is being used by a single component in the system that's tucked away well inside the computer, you may have to take some measurements regarding, say, current use or voltage, and then infer that information using logical conclusions. Much in the same way as using direct measurements and observations, indirect measurements and observations require exceptional standards of excellence when setting up and explaining how you took them. Going back to our heat example in the computer, if you take measurements that don't make much sense, or measurements that don't relate to the actual power use of your computer, then your indirect measurements are not going to be relevant. However, if you build a very strong case for why this particular experiment is going to give you the heat dissipated in a particular component, perhaps it'll show simulations, perhaps it'll show hand calculations, and then finally your results, users will trust you more. However, that evidence is still not as strong as taking a thermometer and figuring it out directly. The next level of support would be a reference to credible information and logical arguments. So this is different from just saying, well, it makes sense that it must be dissipating a lot of heat, therefore it is. You might find a journal article or a magazine article that talks about the heat dissipated in that particular component. You might talk about how a previous study has talked to your users and talked about how many people are coming back to your particular software company. Since you yourself haven't done these observations, it's not as trustworthy because you can't justify every single piece of that piece of evidence. However, it's definitely possible to find excellent credible information and put it together logically in order to make a good argument. The very weakest is opinion. Unfortunately, opinions don't have scientific backing all the time. If I were to tell you that I really like the color purple, you can't really refute that. What if I actually like red and I'm lying to you? What does it matter that I like purple? How am I using that to persuade you? So opinion should not really be trusted. How you can use it though, is if you're trying to argue an opinion piece, you might say other people share this opinion. Notice that that doesn't prove anything. It just means that you are not the only person having this discussion. In terms of external sources, the vast majority of your evidence will probably come from this. It is the third level down on the hierarchy of trustworthy sources. However, there is far more peer-reviewed, excellent experiments than you can possibly do yourself. Eventually, you're going to have to say, look, I can't run this experiment. I have to find someone else who did. I have to make sure that what they did was trustworthy. And I'm going to present their data and appropriately cite it. At the very top is something that has been peer-reviewed. What this means is that the experiment has been run by one group of people and sent off to peers who are ostensibly experts in the field. Those peers have reviewed their work and said, yes, this makes sense. The conclusions work. Below that might be manufactured data. If you're buying a computer and it says that this, this computer uses 50 watts of power, then you can usually trust that the manufacturer is correct. There can certainly be errors in manufactured data, but it's very rare the manufacturer would intentionally tell you something incorrect. Marketing material, however, is usually suspect. Often, marketers will try to talk about the absolute best that a system can do under ideal conditions. But in reality, most systems aren't used in ideal conditions. As a result, you shouldn't rely on marketing material if you're going to make your decision. You should always go back to the manufacturer and say, please give me hard data. Opinion websites are usually suspect. If I have an opinion about a particular brand of computer, certainly the reviews are important, but I cannot use that as the absolute basis for my decision. I still should be looking into the manufacturer's specifications and preferably some kind of more trustworthy source. 
Now that brings us to Wikipedia. Can we use Wikipedia and can we use it as a trustworthy source? It would be great if I said yes to this question. Wikipedia is an amazing resource. And realistically, many studies have shown that Wikipedia is about as accurate as more trustworthy encyclopedias. For example, the Britannica. In fact, if you go to Google and you type in Wikipedia reliability, you'll find a number of hits, including one page on Wikipedia, discussing the reliability of Wikipedia. The problem with it is that it should be your starting point and a quick reference. But reasonably speaking, you should not be the one who's citing Wikipedia. The reason for that is, unless you're an expert, you can't really evaluate the evidence. You can't look at the pages and say, yes, this makes sense, even if they're presented logically, because there might be mistakes that someone at your same level has made. I often use Wikipedia, but I use Wikipedia to go as a starting point, tell me where to look further. I'll explore their links and their references, but very, very rarely will I use a Wikipedia article as a source. The one time Wikipedia is an excellent source is for images and other media. This is because, for the most part, these images have either been reviewed by editors or are extremely high quality. As long as you cite them appropriately, Wikipedia images are okay. To recap, claims are made in all technical writing, even if you don't believe that you're making an opinion piece. You're trying to convince me that I should buy this particular robot. You're trying to convince me I should use your software. And you're trying to convince me that this particular procedure for using your software is the right one. You're still making claims. Different claims require different evidence. Simple facts can be backed up with a single reference. But if a claim is more complex or potentially opinion-based, you'll need to build a very strong argument. Using strong evidence is very important for convincing claims. Try not to use opinions and try not to use marketing data. Peer-reviewed or manufactured data is excellent. Wikipedia is usually not a good source, even though it might be accurate. Unless you're an expert, trusting Wikipedia is not necessarily something you should do.